Well, good evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening on the expert session. Uh, and so the, I'm Brett Christ. I'm the moderator of this session. This is the proximal femur module. Uh, we'll have Keith Mayo, Mark Riley, and Mike Miranda with us this evening as the expert panel. And so these are disclosures. Um, the learning objectives for this module are the, to list the indications for proximal femoral deformity correction and non-union management, utilize femoral deformity correction techniques to restore extra articular alignment and address non-union. So that's what we went over in the lecture portion of the module. And we'll kind of uh, summarize uh, those things right now, and then we'll go into cases that will demonstrate those. So the first talk on last Saturday was by Roger Wilbur on femoral neck non-unions, when to address and how. And so his learning objectives were to understand how much correction is appropriate, know who is a candidate and when to perform the surgery, and then be able to transfer your plan into a surgical tactic. So this is a diagram uh, from Powell's book uh, that showed the amount of correction that, that he was going for to basically trans, uh, to change the forces from a shear force on the ne femoral neck fracture to more of a compressive force. And so you can see that there was significant deformity created, and that was uh, mostly due to the implants available at the time when he was doing these surgeries to try to help people. And so this was a, an article that he presented uh, from Rennie Marti et al. Uh, that looked at healthy patients up to 65 years old with femoral neck nonunions that underwent an uh, intertrochanteric osteotomy, not fixed that way. Um, but they had a union rate of 80 to 90%. A good or excellent result was achieved in 62%. Uh, there's two little bone stock inside the femoral head and a valgus osteotomy does not give, uh, if there is two little bone stock, sorry, in the femoral head, then a valgusation osteotomy doesn't good results. So that would fall in those patients that didn't do well. Um, if somebody has a radiographic sign of avascular necrosis in patients over 30 years old, um, it may be considered a contraindication for osteotomy. We went over that in the question session um, that having a avascular necrosis doesn't automatically kick them out. It depends on what stage of avascular necrosis and their overall health, et cetera. In this study, 65 uh, years and older, uh, total hip replacement may be the best option. So this is something that I learned from uh, Roger back when he did this video for uh, our AO advanced practical uh, on proximal femur osteotomies. Uh, and this is really helpful in trying to understand how the intersection point of the osteotomy really affects uh, leg length and the change in uh, femoral head height that you can obtain. And so this is an example of showing um, where the two lines uh, separate at the center of the femoral head is how much leg length change or femoral head height change will uh, obtain. Um, then he went over his uh, surgical tactic on, from uh, tracing paper and kind of where the blade insertion is and measuring from the trochanter at 16 millimeters down. So it's important to mark all those things uh, uh, on your tracing paper and then as well on your radiographs to understand where intraoperatively you're going to put your wires and uh, blade plate chisel and then the blade plate as well as your osteotomy wire. He brought up mismatch compression. It's been brought up a, a few times. Keith brought it up. Um, but this is basically uh, with uh, angled blade plates, uh, you can create a space in the distal segment uh, and trying to basically have contact of the osteotomy. And then as you're placing that first screw, you have to anchor the plate distally. Uh, with a screw and then the screw nearest the osteotomy you start tightening that down and it both drives the um, blade into the to the proximal segment and then pulls the bone towards the plate and really compresses the osteotomy and that's for higher angled blade plates where you theoretically shouldn't be using the articulated tensioning device so anything over uh, 100 degrees so this is a, an awesome case that he showed uh, in an elderly lady who was uh, like a pro walker really liked walking fast and he didn't feel that uh, hip replacement that, that, that he didn't want it. And so he ended up doing an intertrochanteric osteotomy and used the uh, allograph to improve her offset. And that's what she looked like when she uh, was healed. And so his take home points were, um, there's not really any need for extreme valgus anymore. That was before the angled blade plates and other fixation devices that we use. 
were available. And so really now um, you're trying to restore anatomy and get the fracture to heal as well as uh, get the osteotomy to heal and, and preserve leg length, um, neck shaft angle or CCD angle and offset and consider doing osteotomies uh, for this problem in patients up to about 65 and then really making your plan whether it's digitally or on tracing paper and then transfer it over to the real deal and, and get it done. And then uh, Keith Mayo talked about proximal femoral osteotomies for uh, non-traumatic deformity and looked at different types of uh, hip, hip construct reconstruction, including uh, getting valgus or abduction, adduction plus or minus rotation, neck lengthening, limb shortening, and so this is an example of a, a patient that had had a periacetabular osteotomy that needed that revised as well as a proximal femoral osteotomy. Uh, and this is the uh, end result that he showed. And uh, his points were that it's, this isn't just for femoral neck nonunions. People have rotational issues, valgus issues, varus issues. And it's a, a, the intertrochanteric osteotomy is very versatile in correcting proximal femur non-traumatic deformities as well. And then you can take um, both either vice versa, you can take planning and techniques from non-union to malunion and take to the reconstruction preservation world or vice versa. Mark then talked about paratrochanteric malunions, uh, indications for osteotomy and techniques, and talked about the typical deformity that can happen um, with uh, with that fracture, like an intertroch fracture, paratrochanteric fracture, you can have varus, femoral shaft medialization, shortening, excessive uh, anti-torsion uh, with malrotation, and then kind of how the patient's presented, including gluteal dysfunction, Tranilberg, limb length inequality, different areas of pain, and then also people can complain of low back or knee pain as well. And so the goals of the treatment were like the other areas. So you want to restore the limb length, um, which uh, in restoring the, uh, the abductor length or the offset can help with uh, limping as well as help improve pain. Um, and you want to make a good mechanical sound environment as well as biological environment to get the thing to heal and minimize complications. So, so basically this was an example of an operative plan for a case that he had uh, that showed that was treated with a reconstruction nail um, that was in Varus and he shows his osteotomy there that he used that it was a single closing wedge to correct the angular deformity. Um, and then this is what uh, his plan uh, transferred to. So for intertrochanteric or paratrochanteric nonunions or malunions, uh, they may not be treated that commonly with osteotomy, but understanding the principles and techniques for the intertrochanteric osteotomy can be very helpful for these fractures and make sure you're addressing all the components. Um, you wanna maximize the osteotomy surface area and compress to improve chances of healing and success. Uh, and then he gave a, gave a great, uh, just short presentation on how, how to learn uh, complicated surgeries because these aren't straightforward. And so it's important to find mentors uh, and have a support network that uh, can help you get through those challenging cases. The last uh, lecture in that session was by Mike Miranda who, looked, who uh, talked about rotational deformity for indications uh, for osteotomy and techniques. Uh, and his learning objectives were to understand the importance of objective data in evaluating malrotation, understand the indications for surgical intervention, understand various techniques available for managing, managing this problem surgically. So this has been, uh, he went over what we really should be doing for all patients with malunions or deformity. You want to have a thorough evaluation, you want to create a problem list, look at the indications for the intervention, and then come up with your plan of treatment and execute it. So this was a patient of his where you can see that his drawings on the, on the tracing paper as well as his radiographs. You know, for malrotation, you want to see is it a deviation that's inside or outside of the bell-shaped curve because normal is a relative term for this. And so you want to look at how it affects them uh, compared to their other side. And you can see um, that the patient, both patients laying down have pretty significant uh, change in rotation. And so this was an excellent uh, diagram showing the different types of osteotomies that he considers for the proximal femur and uh, looking at the advantages and disadvantages. 
He also uh, showed some examples of problem lists created. So this is a problem list for the patient that he had with uh, malrotation as well as some varus. He has had translation and leg length discrepancy due to a contralateral fusion. Um, and so it's important to kind of go down and make that list of the problems so you don't forget about anything, even, even you know, writing down that the patient has indwelling hardware that may be broken. That you have to think about ways to get it out. Uh, so, so his take home points were symptoms uh, for malrotation can be vague. Um, using digital software to measure differences, uh, or if you, if you have the ability to use old school uh, uh, tracing paper um, and light boxes, those, that works as well. Um, but the advantages of, uh, especially for rotation, using this, the digital software and CT scans can be very helpful. Make sure you understand what the goals for the patient is and what their problems are, rather than kind of getting fixated on just what their images look like. And then generate that problem list to individualize your treatment based on uh, their, their deformity and what their overall goals are. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and open it up to uh, questions. From the participants. Looks like you may need to keep thinking about questions. So with that, oh, here we go. So let's have, so if uh, Mark and Keith and uh, Mike, if you can go ahead and turn on your video and uh, Mike's. The one question that we have is, um, it doesn't specifically say about which presentation, but uh, it may be talking about Rogers, but I know all you can answer this. Um, why would you use a 95 degree blade plate uh, if you're not putting it in parallel to the osteotomy? Well, I can answer it. And the simple question for the exercise is because that was the only plate that was available in the lab. So I'm not sure that in, in reality, most of us would have used um, a 95 degree plate. The usual reason for using a 95 is because the 100, 110, 120, 130s are all only four hole side plates. So that if you have a subtrochanteric component uh, and you're trying to deal with that, uh, then it limits the amount of side plate fixation you've got. So if you're down to uh, proximal correction utilizing one of the higher angle blade plates, we no longer have the ability to get custom side plate, high angled offset plates available. And that's the main reason why you would go to a 95. But the actual reason why it was used in that lab is because quite frankly, that was the only plate we had available. And then, um... The, for mismatched compression, um, do all of you use that in plates that are above 95 or do you try it with 110s? Um, uh, for, sorry, I, I misspoke. So do you use the articulated tensioning device in blade plates higher than 95? Yeah, I think you can use the articulated tensioning device certainly in 100. You can use it in a 110, but you have to assume that the plate's probably going to open up about 10 degrees on you when you tension it. And um, even a 110 is probably pushing it where when you tension it axially, the plate will have a tendency to pull out uh, of, its, of its tract. So certainly a high angle blade you don't want to. Um, but I have used it in a 110 and, and not gotten into trouble with it, but I wouldn't use it in a 120 or a 130. And it's probably better reserved for the 90, 95, and 100. Anybody else? I know, Keith, you feel pretty similar not using it over a, or you're using mismatch in anything over 100. Is that right? Yeah, I think the problem is that um, I, in young patients with hard bone, you're not really ever gonna pull the plate out of the proximal segment. Um, it's just, in fact, in a young patient, unless you've really carefully plate, uh, 
executed your plan, once the blade goes in, it's not coming out. So, um, uh, so the actual, the, the real reason for using mismatch compression is that in an oblique osteotomy, it's very difficult um, with any type of standard plate holding clamp to actually generate the kind of compression that you can get with mismatch using the ATD. So with an oblique osteotomy, you really, you end up with a tremendous, tremendous amount of shear and it's very difficult to keep the side plate in position. So you end up usually hybridizing, you put the ATD on, the plate comes off the bone proximally. So you get a little bit of mismatch with the ATD anyhow. And the only other thing I, I would any mention, other. I'm sorry, the, the only other thing I would just mention is the fact that you need to have at least a centimeter and a half of shoulder or bone underneath that, uh, underneath your blade. Uh, one of the uh, uh, errors <laughs> that you can make is putting in uh, less than that, you can run into problems with it pulling out. That, that's true. That's true for the articulated tension device as well as the mismatch or offset compression. There are uh, some questions about some stuff about Roger specific presentation and we'll go, we'll show you later as far as how you can go back and watch those videos on YouTube. Um, you touched on it. Um, I think Roger and Keith may have touched on it on Saturday, but there's a question about um, does doing a proximal femoral osteotomy make a total hip harder and how do you try to manage that? And maybe just run through the keys that you mentioned as far as to make it easier. Like I'll go start with Keith since, since I knew I know he mentioned it. Sorry. Right. So I, I think that you know, the goal after the osteotomy is that your proximal femur on the osteotomy side should look like the proximal femur on the other side, assuming it was normal to start with. So you'd want to replicate a normal CCD angle. You, know, you want to have no significant shaft offset. Um, and so I have limited experience. Mark probably has more than I do, but I, you know, I have converted osteotomies to total hips. You have to reestablish a canal usually by drilling and then by very careful broaching, um, but you can still do it. But the, the, the more offset you have, the more difficult it becomes. And I have one case where I had to do, go back and actually do a secondary osteotomy at the time of the stem placement um, and then use a lateral plate for support. So yes, I think the, the reason why total joint surgeons hate osteotomies is one is um, I think that historically we, we've created some really bad deformities for them and it's just not necessary to get um, the goal which is achieving union. Yeah, absolutely. We should be restoring the normal anatomy to the proximal femur. So we actually should be making it easier to do a total uh, hip later in a, in a patient if, uh, you know, that, that's facing that. Um, you know, that, as Keith mentioned, the, the scenarios, but essentially, if you don't, if you have the trochanter lined up over the femoral shaft or the piriformis fossa is offset over the shaft of the femur, you can tell, one, you're obviously distorting the, what, what should be the normal anatomy of the proximal femur, but clearly you're going to make it harder for, a, for an arthroplasty. But done well, an osteotomy should not make it more difficult beyond the obvious anatomic you know, scarring or previous surgery that it adds uh, you know, to, the, uh, to the later dissection. You, there's a question about if you have some healing of the uh, femoral neck fracture uh, inferiorly, do you ever consider bone grafting or do you always do an osteotomy? Uh, you know, I've, personally, I find it very difficult to, to talk about a small amount of, or, you know, of incremental healing in a, in a femoral neck fracture and, and be able to assess that. I, I can't tell the difference between an immobile non-union after you remove the hardware and something with a with a small bridge I, I don't know how I would look at something and say oh that's that'll be okay to, to bone graft so if I really think it is ununited uh, even if there's the possibility of a bridge somewhere um, for me I'm going to treat that ununited neck with an osteotomy. Mike what are your thoughts? 
I, I agree. I think it's hard to bone graft. Uh, and I, I've, I've had the feeling or the perception that uh, I, I don't know that I was adequately treating it. And so I feel much better doing an osteotomy and realigning the mechanics. I think it also creates the amount of compression that I want and re-stimulates healing. So it restarts the whole biologic process. And, and yeah. you know, and, and typically the non-union of the of the neck, or it's what has gone on to a non-union, even if it has a, an area of of healing, there's some deformity associated with it as well. And so the advantage of the osteotomy is restoring the normal anatomy of the femur, in addition to the to improving the chance for union. Um, there is a question about uh, if there's a residual gap between the plate and the um, bone, and any. Basically, they're asking about any tricks to address avoiding implant failure. Like, if you if you haven't gotten, uh, we'll start with you, Mike. Uh, any like complete um, plate, the plate's not completely sitting on the bone. Say that at that first screw hole. Do you do anything uh, differently? Like, do you go back and change things to to get it there, or do you have concerns about implant failure? No, I mean, I think the most important thing really is the compression uh, uh, of the two bones. So if you've, if you've created offset, I mean, if you've created a mismatch and as you bring that uh, distal fragment laterally, it compresses, it doesn't really matter if the plate's directly on the bone or not, because right now what's happening is the bone is supporting the plate and actually protecting the plate. So um, the bone is taking more of the weight. So I don't worry about, about failure because now I've got uh, I've got the bone helping out the plate. And so um, I, I really think that that's an advantage. Yeah, just like, just like slotting the plate into the bone, leaving it uh, proud from the proximal fragment is a technique that we use in order to be able to create the appropriate offset between the shaft and the proximal fragment that we want. So it may well be that if you encountered that and it was not the way that you planned it, you might have to change the length of the blade to create the offset that you were planning for. But we frequently plan for the situation where the proximal part of the blade is not fully seated. Right, sorry, it's fully seated, but it's not flush on the proximal fragment. Right. And so what do, you, what do you typically plan for just to help them understand? Like, what are you, are you trying to go five millimeters? leaving it five millimeters proud or what do you use as your guide? Well, you should know from your, you should know from your plan what it's going to look like. And, and there are times, I mean, if you're looking at ex extreme uh, AB ductions, which you usually do for uh, other types of deformity cases, then you may be a centimeter out of bone in order to get the kind of lateralization you want. Now those are usually not trauma cases, but, you should know what your blade length is and where you how much of the blade you want out. And if in some cases, if you're using a 95 instead of an offset 110 or 120, if you're really worried about being able to immediately displace the shaft with a 95, it's very difficult. So you have to cut out the shoulder where the seat, the plate seats, and make sure you can fully engage it, and then occasionally you'll have to use one or more washers underneath the screws in the proximal part of the plate to maintain medial shaft position. Um, so the, the, the strength of the construct, as everybody said, it comes from the, from the tension. There is a modest loss of torsional strength if you don't have direct plate apposition to the lateral cortex. But most of your torsional resistance comes from compression across the osteotomy. All right. It looks like we got uh, either live or I answered a couple, um, typed them out. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on to the cases. And so this first case, this is a 52-year-old male who five months prior uh, sustained a left femoral neck fracture and shaft fracture that was treated with one device. And he was doing okay early on, but um, he was referred to me because of five months, he was still having uh, pain and groin pain that was getting worse. And so these, this is uh, actually a scout CT view that he came with that got them both on one view. 
And these are some plain radiographs showing uh, his hip fracture. So he's got a, a transcervical femoral neck fracture that at five months, I don't know if you could call it a delayed union, but that's what I chose for both of them. Uh, you can see that at least on the distal aspect of the lateral view, you can see that he has some callus formation on his femoral shaft. Uh, that's bridging at least anteriorly. And then this is a more uh, AP view of the shaft component. So maybe some bridging laterally. He definitely has some callus formation, but it's not completely bridged. I'm not sure the medial side's bridged or bridging, I should say. Um, and this is just trying to show what his rotation is like just with two films from the plane films anyway, or his rotation profile. So he had this CT scan that he came with. Um, and so right, can, you go, can you go back to the, the plane film for a second? Sure. This one or farther back? The yeah, previous to that. We don't have a comparison of the contralateral hip yet, but uh, mm -hmm. back to the AP of the hip. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. So like just looking at that, looking at that compared to the other side, the, you know, the first impression is that the offset between the, well, uh, you know, clearly there's a problem with the reduction, but the offset between the femoral head and the femoral shaft doesn't look unreasonable compared to the other side. And there's a centimeter and a half to two centimeters of screw sticking out laterally, um, yeah. which is some, somewhat surprising that it, uh, that it got there. But, um, yeah, so I anyway, was just pointing that out as well. So this is a CT scan, uh, proximal and distal cuts uh, showing the difference in rotation. And so like we learned from Mitch's uh, talk, um, we can either rotate the image or we can, if they're going in different directions, they're additive. So he has 38 degrees of anti-torsion roughly. Um, on that side. And you can see he has a little disuse osteopenia in his distal femur. And you can see his uh, femoral neck reduction. It's translated posteriorly, as you can see there on the proximal cut. What, what's, his, uh, what's his torsion on the other opposite side and what's his rotation? Yeah, so he didn't have, this was, he already had the CT scan, so I don't have a rotational profile of the right side. Um, and his rotation on this side was 10 degrees of internal and 30 degrees of external supine. What was it on the other side? He had 20 degrees of internal and 30 degrees of external on the right side. And so I tried to patch the two uh, lateral views together uh, they were, you know, may not be in the same position, but tried to position them. Um, and you could see that there seems to be a lot of, you know, it kind of correlates with the increased antitorsion distally when you look at the proximal and distal aspects of the films. Yeah. And so really these are, a it doesn't make any difference. If he doesn't have a rotational asymmetry, you're not going to correct it. So in general, if you've got excessive antiversion, you should have a significant increase of medial rotation over lateral rotation because that's what you're going to rob. Yeah. If he, he, only, has, he, if he only has 10 degrees, then, um, and you relatively retrovert him from where he is now, and it looks like he doesn't have much neck offset anteriorly, and he's short, he won't be happy. What would be your cutoff, Keith? Well, I, I think, you know, you assess rotation in extension, prone, and flexion. And if it correlates, well, I mean, if he's got, uh, on both sides, he's got diminished head neck offset, even on his right side. Um, and now he's got a relatively foreshortened femoral neck with maybe a trace of um, neck retro tilt. Okay, so we've got two different components of the deformity now. We've got probably a medial rotation uh, at the diaphysis and a retro tilt or retroversion of the neck relative to the metaphysis. Um, and so in order to 
you have to decide whether or not you're willing to do a femoral neck osteotomy in this situation, which is probably not a good idea. Or you're, you may have to just accept the fact uh, with his neck deformity, um, with his rotational profile being what it is, that um, you don't have the clinical rotational asymmetry you need to do a derotation, and then you're just going to address the neck by itself and leave him where he is rotationally. I guess what I was saying is in this, in this situation, looking at the difference between, you know, your, your hip extension and hip flexion rotational profiles, is there a threshold where you feel like you're going to correct both the torsional deformity at the neck and the torsional deformity at the femur or ignore I one? Yeah, no, in, in this sitting, I think I would always rely on the exam and flexion because that's what's going to, that's what his, his problem is going to be. So if you flex him to 90 degrees, and unless he has a major increase in medial rotation over lateral rotation, and you derotate him, he's not going to be happy with you. Because you're basically. He was, he, he was really painful with attempted range of motion on the left side to the where he didn't really want to get on his stomach to do it. So I was kind of relying more on his imaging. Um, than his like true yeah. clinical exam because he was so limited. He was painful in extension when you tried to rotate his hip. With his yes, well in the in the flex position, supine flex position at ninety degrees. Yeah, so I think it's really hard in those situations. To, I mean, I, I don't know whether he's painful because uh, uh, you're stressing his non-union or because he's impinging and I, or both. And in this yeah. situation, it looks like both and. <clears throat> But and he was in having those, in those situations, I definitely would be very careful about giving him anything that's going to increase his hip impingement. Okay. I probably should have talked to you the first time before this then. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's this CCD angle. So he has about a five degree difference uh, from my measurements. Um, and he, he actually had true pain in his groin and his shaft. So he, he, I thought he was symptomatic from both. Um, and so his pals angle, which we talked about before, isn't necessarily as critical as it was, you know, back when it was described because we don't try to change it down to like less than 20 degrees or what have you. But this is what, uh, I measured for his pals angle. So he has a pals three and his offset, like Mark astutely mentioned was very similar to his other side. Uh, and his leg length difference was 28 millimeters. And he, um, he had his CT scanogram, so I didn't, I didn't make him do a, an extremity alignment series. So I usually do get uh, non-union lab work up and really the only abnormality was uh, low vitamin D, which, you know, 80% of people may have anyway, uh, even without a non-union. So we we're going to correct that. But um, this, sir, this is his problem list. So he has increasing hip and thigh pain. So it wasn't getting better. It was getting worse, both of them. He has an ipsilateral Powell's three and femoral shaft, which I'm calling delayed unions. He has his retained uh, cephalomedullary nail, uh, five degree difference for CCD angle, 38 degrees of anatorsion on that side, uh, 28 millimeters of leg length discrepancy, and then the low vitamin D. So what, what, what would you, you think the varus was at the shaft compared to the other side? Uh, I'll tell you, I didn't, it didn't look more than five degrees. So I didn't really, I didn't measure it to be honest with you, but that's a good point. Cause that would be a few, maybe a millimeter difference leg length discrepancy. But it's potentially, I so mean, what would you guys, you're, you're not going to alter your plan at the hip necessarily because of the varus at the femur. Well, you might, but, um, but I think you have to think about it, right? Because dependent upon the, offset that you're going to create between the shaft and the and the femoral head that might affect his mechanical axis to, to have the residual varus in the shaft. Yeah. So what would uh, any other thoughts from Mike or Keith as far as or what you guys would think about doing at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's I think, again, to, get, to me, the critical part is the exam. I, I lost a screen share, so I'm going this miniature view now. But um, I would say that uh, the only way to, 
to technically compensate for this with um, is to you if you have a rotational uh, problem anywhere in the shaft, there are theoretical problems creating a secondary point of malrotation just because of muscle origins, right? So, right. Um, so in a situation like this, theoretically, you could make up for his um, his excessive anatorsion through a rotation at the proximal closing wedge, assuming that's what you did, um, abduction osteotomy for the femoral neck and then um, leave the distal uh, component to bit whether, no matter which way you decide you're gonna, I assume you're gonna stabilize it with something, either a retrograde nail or a plate. And then, um, but um, ideally, um, since you're gonna be there anyway, um, and it looks like, I would think about correcting his rotation where the rotational problem is, which is in the shaft and then uh, try to make up for his, uh, his proximal deformity at the, with slight changes in antiversion at the level of your uh, proximal femoral osteotomy. I agree with you, Keith. I think the, um, you know, one of the concerns that I would have is that the farther proximal you go with regard to uh, your thoughts on changing the rotation, you, you the, anatomic and mechanical axes become more disparate as opposed to distally where they're much more aligned. So uh, doing the, uh, doing the derotation distally, I think would help you, uh, would help as far as maintain the normal uh, mechanical alignment as well. So that's the other thought that I would have. Yeah, I, I would vote for doing the rotation at the diathesis and I would also vote for not doing it now. I think I would let the diaphysis finish healing in this position, treat his hip, not attempt to create a new rotational deformity, and then if his hip, uh, if, if and when his hip is healed, reassess the degree to which he, he's bothered by his rotation. I mean, obviously tell him ahead of time that, that's the, that it's a staged plan, um, but uh, I think that complicates things more than I would want to, to try and so take Mark, you're, time. you're saying you would do uh, August producing osteo intertroch osteotomy and stop there. Yeah, if I had a gross non-union of the femoral shaft, I would, I would probably change that. But if I've got a uniting femoral shaft fracture that's mal-rotated, I think I would leave it be, let it heal treat the hip with a valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy and then reassess where he's at when we're done. I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, you can, you're going to have to take out the nail anyway. I just wonder what it would, his stability would be distally. So you either have to address that with a longer plate and therefore use a 95 degree uh, blade plate or um, even do, uh, you use a short osteotomy plate proximally and then do a retrograde nail distally. And so, um, those are the things that you'd have to contend with. And so as a result, I think I would probably opt for doing the osteotomy proximally and then evaluating uh, things distally, pre being prepared to do a derotation osteotomy through the distal diaphysis with fixation using a retrograde nail. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm with Mark. I, I think um, his antiversion is protective at this point. So He's got a mild varus, which is in part rotational. We already talked about that. But um, his excessive anatorsion, unless it's a huge problem with his gait, if he's in towing and tripping over himself, then that's a problem. But it is, his excessive anatorsion is actually protecting his hip. And so right, I, there's, I, there's I, certainly I, some. I go ahead protect. and get it to do the abduction osteotomy, let it heal. Um, I personally don't like retrograde nails. I just uh, pull a nail, do a minimally invasive compression plate, and then see how it sorted out. And you can always come back and do uh, diaphyseal derotation later. So Keith, you do a separate um, plate laterally to address the and position it separate from where you're blade plate would be yeah i would, okay. I, would I don't I think it's it's adding a huge degree of difficulty to take a six, 16 or 18 hole a 95 degree blade plate bend it 
and then make sure that you're exactly on um, distally and proximally. So, um, is it is Brett? Is anybody else having trouble with Brett's connection, or is it just? I don't. Yeah. I can't tell. If it's my yeah, my. the the, uh, the audio is a bit garbled, and then I lost screen share a long time ago, so I have this miniature picture. Getting so I apologize. Um, and now it says it is. Uh, sorry about that. Can you see it, Mike? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, those are all uh, great. Obviously, um, I I went uh, for the proximal part, and I didn't uh, share everything with you. Uh, because of you can kind of get an idea about where his uh, where maybe some of the problem is at least previously based on um, kind of where his incisions are um, that I didn't have a photo for surgery and I'll show you here in a second but this was what I was thinking was a 30 degree valgus producing osteotomy um, and I actually um, based on that information wanted to try to do uh, take some of his ana anatorsion down and then try to get his leg length closer. And his offset was pretty equal there. So I didn't feel like we needed to address that. And one of the, um, Dr. Schatzker mentioned, consider it a uh, functional varus, which that's true. The uh, head height was a little bit concerning for me though. Um, but I did think about doing it through the diaphysis as well, which doing it, uh, you know, doing the intertroch osteotomy and then doing uh, separate rotational osteotomy through the femur I thought was a lot in time because he was healing uh, his diaphysis. Um, so the plan was to remove the nail, uh, transition to a retrograde nail, which uh, Keith had pointed out some good points. Um, you know, obviously I'm violating the knee now, which um, could be avoided if you uh, do a plate. Uh, but these were the intermed or uh, intraoperative uh, floral images, um, took the nail out, uh, pinned the femoral neck approximately uh, to try to stay out of the way of everything, um, got the nail in. But here's what I was talking about. Like you can see when they put the nail in that their initial locking bolts distally were very posterior and so was his um, proximal incision. And so that made me think that it may not necessarily be through the diaphysis uh, because they had to, to, they had to aim so anterior to get it into the to the head and neck segment, um, and so it looked like he had a lot of uh, extension or, or retroversion of his femoral neck, maybe a little bit, but not a ton. So I didn't feel like, I thought it was maybe his anatomy proximally that was the problem. Um, so that's kind of why I went with that, um, and this is just getting just going through for the participants, uh, looking at the different things that I did. So I had, I got consent from our fellow to show his face. So, um, but this is the goniometer that you use interoperatively. And then uh, you can use uh, an app on most uh, mobile devices have an app where you can do goniometer. And so we set up the wires 20 degrees apart and then uh, uh, got them parallel. It's I think it's easier to do that um, to make them 20 or whatever degree correction you're doing apart and then making them parallel at the end with the blade plate chisel for the distal rotational orientation just because it's much easier to make things parallel than to make them 20 degrees separate. Um, and then did some mismatch compression and then put a separate uh, lag screw across the femoral neck just to add, because he's a pretty big guy. And that was, I thought I ended up with about 15 degrees of antiversion comparing a true lateral distally and an axial lateral proximal. And that's what it looked like post-operatively. So oh, Brett? Yeah. It looks like your intertrogenderic osteotomy was oblique. Uh, I did. Uh, I, I went part of the way through, just like the plan showed. So the oblique one, the, the oblique limb, sorry, the oblique limb, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I'll try to annotate here. 
the oblique limb start stopped here and then just finished as a transverse to try to get more leg length. So okay. it was a closing with opening. Okay. Right, because, uh, because you can't rotate through an oblique osteotomy without creating a gap or a malalignment. Right, so I did, I did the transverse first, just like you no, had talked about, so thanks for, for bringing it up. So I did, yeah, yep, exactly. Uh, I did the transverse one first, then did the rotation. Nice. Sorry, my screen froze too because I had the annotate tool up. And so I did get uh, higher than his other side as far as the CCD angle. So he was at 138. Yeah, I haven't gotten been able to get an extremity alignment series yet, but uh, thanks to uh, Raul's hip center tools. Um, uh, I was able to get a, maybe a more accurate way of doing the CCD angle to make sure I was centered. And so for that one, um, I, I think using one device for two fractures can be challenging uh, and it, it potentially creates a problem. These both were delayed unions, um, but uh, we want to make sure that femoral neck fracture reduction is done uh, to be as anatomical as possible. It's critical. It's a thing that's been shown to be something that we can do to, to affect outcomes for femoral neck fractures. Um, you don't want to sacrifice the reduction of one fracture to address the other. Um, you want to do a thorough uh, workup metabolically for non-unions. Um, it's just something that you can potentially address um, outside of the surgery that we do. Um, and then correct the deformity and improve the biomechanics so things heal um, and just make sure like uh, Mitch had showed and other people have shown that you, and Mike showed it to uh, evaluate uh, torsion and address it. Um, it's a good point. I could have done, um, Keith brought up great points and so did Mark. I could have done them separately and just tried to get the femoral neck heel to heal to, uh, to see how he did. But he's actually, he said he He's not that far post-op. He's still less than um, three months out. So he's not quite full weight bearing to where he could get a good extremity alignment series. But he's uh, he, even right after surgery, I saw him in the hospital the next day. He said that's the best he's felt uh, since he's broken it. So it may have just been uh, he wanted to make me feel good about myself, but he was he felt good. Any other comments or Thoughts before we move on. Patients happy? That's Got about. All, that's all accounts. Okay, so case two. Can I? Um, this can is I a ask a question? Sure. Um, it, not in a situation like this because it, it wasn't that significant, but where you have a significant torsional deformity through the femoral neck non-union. Um, Keith, do you, do you, would you typically combine that with a debridement or would you attempt union first knowing that uh, a, a debridement may be or will be necessary later? Yeah, I think it, I mean, a lot of it, I, I, I'll just go back and underscore that if you're going to do a derotation, the clinical exam has to give you something to rob. So you can't make up motion. All you can do is reset it. And so uh, that's number one. So if I had somebody that had a, like many, many men have pre-existing asymptomatic CAM lesions, and then they end up being retroverted at, uh, because of the reduction in a situation like that, and only twice uh, so far I have gone back and did at the same time an osteotomy done a, you could do it arthroscopically, but I did mine open through a, a hooter because they're anterior neck decompression. Um, you can't, I think it's personally for me, uh, I don't feel like I have the skill level to go back and do a revision of the neck osteotomy with a retinacular flap. So I would, if it had a pre-existing cam lesion, and it looked like they were gonna impinge no matter what I did, then I would go ahead and do an osteoplasty, uh, either open or have an arthroscopic uh, decompression done at the same time. Um, but, and that would be largely based on what the rotational exam was 
um, primarily inflection. All right, we'll try to, we'll get through this case and then we'll uh, do the summary. Uh, so this is a 67 year old uh, ground level fall, had a left paratrochanteric femur fracture fixed by one of my partners, not who most of you think. He has diabetes mellitus. He's a former heavy drinker. He used to be a dentist. He, had, he has severe left ankle arthritis. And I fixed his right olecranon about 10 years prior, which uh, he did all right from. He was starting to have some bilateral uh, lower extremity giving way and balance issues. And so there, the neurology folks were working him up for cerebellar ataxia or early Parkinson's. Um, and this is uh, the best kind of view that I had of a CT scan he got sent to me um, with. And, and this was, I couldn't get the, um, the intra-op and post-operative x-rays because they were at an outside facility and they didn't get loaded up to our system. But this is what uh, he looks like when he sees me about four months after. Um, is, he got this before he saw me. So this is four months. They were worried about uh, progressive collapse, um, obviously, and falling into Varus. And one of the things um, with that I've seen with uh, short nails is that if they have a large uh, canal mismatch with the nail is that this can happen because there's only one locking bolt distally. And so he drifted into varus until his distal aspect of his nail hit his lateral cortex. Um, and so in this situation, I would typically try to do a long nail if there's a lot of mismatch. This is what are some other cuts for a CT scan. So he uh, comes back. Uh, this is actually when he sees me because he's still having some pain. They kind of are continuing to work up his um, neurological stuff. They were worried about doing anything before then. So this is when he sees me. He has a, a, another CT scan got sent with him. So this is when I see him now. and he had a 3D reconstruction. It didn't really seem like he had really a sagittal plane issue or at least uh, to address. He couldn't get an extremity alignment series because he was stuck in plantar flexion because of his ankle arthritis. Um, so he had, this is the best kind of CT scanogram that I had. Um, and so by using his femur axes, he had about a 20 degree difference for his CCD angle um, and about almost 19 degrees uh, of an anatomical axis varus deformity through the fracture. And his leg length discrepancy uh, was about 18 millimeters as well. So everything was about, you know, 18, which made it easy from a mass standpoint. So he had um, this malunion because it looked like he had healed more. Um, he was still having pain. He has 18.7 degrees of varus, uh, the anatomical axis, 18 degrees CCD angle difference. Um, offset was, I forgot to mention that, it was 12 millimeters difference, and he has an 18 millimeter leg length uh, difference. And so in talking with him, he, he's always in kind of just dealing with him with his olecranon. He's always somebody who obviously most people do want to avoid surgery, but he was more kind of worried about his ankle um, his pain was improving. He still was working on the neuro stuff, although they, they were down the pathway more. He hadn't seen anybody for his bone health, so we were getting, in a, getting him in to get evaluated for that. And he was going to come back in a couple months uh, to see how he was doing. So within that time, about a month later, he falls and breaks his right hip, uh, which you can see has a comminuted femoral neck fracture. Um, one of my other partners did a hemiarthroplasty. Um, three months later, he has another ground level fall. And this is when he comes back to me uh, because he has a pelvis fracture now. He has a minimally displaced LC1. Um, and he did see bone health and he got started on some medications. It wasn't, uh, he got started on Fosamax. Um, but uh, this is what a CT scan of his uh, femur looks like because they did get a CT scan of his pelvis. Um, and so this, these are the reconstruction views of his 
inner troke, pair troke. His ankle issues done or still no, bothering? Still bothering him. He can he can get around in Crocs basically. And sorry, the ankle's on this side. It's the lateral. Yeah. So um, he's uh, basically had no change in his parameters. He this is an, about a month uh, after he's not having any groin pain. It's all pain over his not over his helical blade, but kind of right in his proximal femur. And it may have been that he kind of stirred things up with this fall, um, but he's just kind of tired of dealing with his hip now. So what would you, th these are his differences as far as just to, I know I went through a bunch of stuff with his other injuries, but this is what is, I measured as far as this. So 18 degrees, see what, the what angle you difference. What did you think was the source of the new pain, Brett? Um, it was kind of, he had, it had gotten better for a while. It was the same spot at, that it was painful before over his hip fracture. But now his, like, even his groin pain, he had, uh, right after his, uh, pelvis fracture, he didn't really have posterior pain. It was all groin pain from his rami fractures. And that pain had actually gone away, um, when he saw me a month later. And so it was all based on his inner trochanteric area and not over his helical blade. It wasn't like he had trochanteric uh, bursitis type pain. It was a deep ache and uh, he had pain with motion or not his groin. So what, what would you guys do? Leave it alone, uh, consider osteotomy, do a total hip, use a nail for osteotomy. Yeah, I mean, the indications become hard because malunions typically, they, they either have pain because of their deformity and, and impingement on something, or they have pain because of their hardware, right? It'd be unusual for somebody to have just sort of pain at rest in a malunion. Yeah, that's why I didn't know if he was really truly healed on the CT scan that he had. Okay. And that was the hard thing is it, you know, each the plain films show that he may be healed, but he was still having pain that was pretty consistent in the area um, where it was before. He just had these interval things that caused him pain, like his hemi, you know, the femoral neck on the right side, his pelvis fracture, but that pain resolved and he still was having pain in the same area on the left side. So his pain is proximal lateral side. But not peritrochanteric. Right, but not over. Not over. It was. Oh, it was right where his fracture is. Basically, it wasn't over the blade. Like if you touched where the blade is, that didn't bother him. But and if you moved his hip, it would bother. Him. And it wasn't where the short nail is um, abutting his lateral cortex. That's a great point. He could have a stress, stress concentration and causing pain there. It didn't really look like he, over that time, it didn't look, look like he had a, a cortical hypertrophy or like a stress response there either. On that last film, it did look like there was a little bit of cortical re reaction there. It just looks bowed out a little bit. He, well, I, I mean, it, to me, it looked like it did. Um, Before. Yeah. Okay. So like you can see, that's maybe not, it's a little bit. It looked like pretty similar to me, like he um, kind of the, the nail curated out his endosteum to where um, he had a bevel there. Well, I mean, it's, you got two choices. I mean, really, you can just say live with it or and then you, once you decide not, if he said he can't do that and you think he's a decent candidate, I mean, the easy thing, although it's not always easy in this situation, is to pull the implant, see if it gets better, um, or just incorporate that into a plan and try to make his proximal femur look normal. He's already proven that he can heal it. And so, I mean, the, the aggressive way, even in this clinical context, would be pull a nail and go for a template that gives him a normal proximal femur 
um, which would give them the best chance. I can't really tell from my imaging what, what his underlying joint looks like, but. Um, uh, it, he didn't have any degenerative changes that he didn't have any cystic changes or loss of joint space or osteophytes. Um, so Dr. Baumgartner uh, agrees. How about taking out the hard hardware and uh, reassess? Um, I went for the fences. So I did an osteotomy, which is the osteotomy course, I guess. But Brad, I mean, presumably I you're also going to include it. You're, you're also going to include an infection workup in here. And so that, that yeah. also offers you the opportunity to biopsy them by taking his hardware out. So it's something to keep in mind for sure. Yeah, and his, just like the other guy, the non-union workup was otherwise negative. Um, there wasn't any elevated CRP or, or SUD rate, uh, and there wasn't any other metabolic things to address besides what he was getting for his bone health. Um, so we'll quickly, we're after 8 o'clock, so I'll kind of just go through the, um, just the, it, this is just the importance of making sure you're down the center of the neck. Um, there's a 30 degree angle that if you start too posterior, you're going to go in, out, in, uh, which is bad. Um, and this one was a 20 degree all the way across. I didn't address any rotational issues. It was just a single plane. You can see the wedge there. Um, and then did mismatch compression and lined up his lateral cortex. And like other people have said, I mean, it didn't bother me that that screw is working in the proximal segment, it's bending, but um, he had good compression of his osteotomy, even though he had not the best bone quality. And I still don't understand how they got some of the x-rays that they got. But um, the one of the points that Sirkin made is, do you ever check with a total hip template to see if you could do a total hip if you need to? And his canal lines up well. That's a, um, a template for a, um, uh, on growth stem. Uh, but that's where he looks like 13 months post-op. And he ended up uh, healing it, which I was concerned that he would uh, potentially have failure just because of his bone quality. But like most, um, even osteoporotic patients, his diaphyseal components of his screws or subtroke screws were really good. And this is uh, what he looked like compared. It's not really fair to compare his Hemi, but um, he got to about 127 degrees. So, uh, and part of that, like Keith had mentioned, maybe the ro it's a little bit hard to get his rotation right for his uh, AP pelvis because his troke is off um, from his fracture, but uh, um, set's not bad. Um, and he has a four millimeter difference of that. His leg lengths, I, I thought, looked similar as, as far as what's coming from his femur. Because um, then he ended up getting his ankle arthroplasty a year after I did that surgery. And then he uh, didn't ever come back. Was his pain uh, better, Brett? Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was really happy afterwards. Good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have shown it if it crapped out and he, had, he was, he hated it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me uh, ask a question. Um, in a sure. situation with a contralateral arthroplasty where you're trying to achieve length, are you willing to over lengthen somebody to match their arthroplasty or uh, are we only willing to set their anatomy back to its relative normal with the proximal femoral osteotomy? For me, I was worried about his ability to handle anything but a closing wedge osteotomy from a healing standpoint. So I thought I would either alter his geometry by lateralizing his shaft more or taking a risk with the opening and closing wedge combo to where he would have a higher rate of failure. So that's why I didn't, uh, uh, I, th I, for me personally, it would depend on the patient and this guy didn't want to do it just because of his bone quality. Mike or Keith. No, the only other... go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, I, I certainly in this setting would not try to equalize leg lengths through, through an osteotomy. That's going to be difficult anyhow. So I, I try to make it look like a normal proximal femur as close as possible so that if I had to in the future, then I could put a stem in and theoretically that would give me a better chance within reason and within limits to get leg length equalization. 
So one, one other question for, for everybody. Um, sometimes with the proximal femoral deformities, not necessarily the femoral neck, um, you've got a union, but you can still identify the plane of the old fracture. Is, is your preference to re-osteotomize through the plane of the old fracture or create your osteotomy plan as if it's a completely healed femur um, and, and do a separate osteotomy through the fracture site or adjacent to or at the fracture site? I think it's uh, helpful if you go back through the deformity. Otherwise, uh, you, want, you don't want to uh, create another deformity uh, and create a Z uh, or, or, or just you know, augment your, your deformity. So I think that uh, if you can, I go through the uh, fracture site. Having said that, I'll uh, also consider going through in those, situ in those situations where there's a blade um, or like a TFN um, or a lateral screw, uh, taking, trying to incorporate the osteotomy. So take out that bone because that's a pretty big hole and use that uh, site for the osteotomy if I can. How about you, Keith? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always conceptually better to try to, to use your previous deformity and correct it. It's not always possible. Um, and certainly in younger patients, uh, you certainly don't want to end up with a compensatory deformity, which is going to be a, a lifelong disability. But um, in situations like this, Sometimes you have to mitigate, you know, what you want to be the best possible looking femur with what you think the patient can actually deal with and heal. So, but in general, I think Mike's absolutely correct that you go where the deformity is. So with that, we'll kind of finish up, uh, list the take home points for the module or list the indications for proximal femoral deformity correction, non-union management and utilize deformity correction technique to restore the extra articular anatomy. Um, basically, the uh, way you can get to the YouTube channel, I'm going to have Mike show you here right uh, before we close um, how to get there. But all of the previous sessions are available on YouTube. Um, and then also now it's a little bit different, but if you go to the AONA webpage and go to the learn more for the osteotomy weekly, when that comes up on the banner page, it'll actually take you to this um, registration and link page. Uh, and so the previous sessions are available with uh, YouTube links that are there embedded in there. And then if the session is upcoming, uh, it allows you to register. The only caveat would be if you try to look at the YouTube link on Sunday or Monday, it may not take you to that, that uh, page on YouTube. So if you're doing that uh, for that same week session, I would uh, just wait until Tuesday probably to be safe. Um, so Saturday, uh, this Saturday, we're going to talk about proximal femur cases. Uh, we're going to have everybody get broken up into uh, breakout rooms, and we're going to work through uh, proximal femur cases with them. So there'll be two faculty members um, per group. Uh, and so we're going to try to divide you guys up so you can uh, interact with faculty and work through those cases. And we're going to try to do it like we do at live events. So like we've said before, be patient, you know, uh, like I had some audio or visual issues. Um, it, it's going to happen. This is the first time that we're doing this with potentially over 200 people. So uh, be patient. If you get kicked off, jump back on and we'll try to address uh, all those glitches and get you, get you where you need to be. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll um, send it over to Mike to share a screen to show you get, how to, to get to uh, YouTube. And share yours, Brett. Mike, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, here we are on YouTube. The easiest way that I've found to do it, we don't have enough uh, visitors yet at, at our trauma web pages, is I just type here AO North America. And this will bring you to the AO North America YouTube channel. But we really want to be on the AO Trauma YouTube uh, web, uh, channel. Um, and so 
there's two ways to get there. One is you can go on channels. The other way is to go here on the right where it says AO Trauma North America. So that's our channel. So I am asking everybody to make sure they subscribe. I just went there to AO North America. You can see I'm subscribed to the North America as well as to the AO North America, uh, the AO Trauma North America. You will not have these blue things. This is allowing me to do things. Currently, we're right on the home screen. You can see osteotomy course because I'm continually updating. If it's not there, then just go to playlists. And currently, it's up here on the left, and you can look for osteotomy course, and you can do view playlist. And what we have here, we currently have all the weeks of the osteotomy course. Uh, we even have the experts, uh, and they're the full um, amount of time. We've gone to also breaking down the live sessions from Saturday to the component lecturer. So you can see here's week three and here is Rogers, Mike's, Keith's and Mark Riley's individual lectures as well as the full uh, lecture for the hour and 41 minutes. So we'll keep this updated so that you can continue to um, uh, have a complete uh, video uh, place to go back and review some of this complicated um, material. Thanks. <laughs>